welcome to another video by Matthew McKenzie, a carer from South London. This video coincides with National Co-Production Week and I've also written a lovely blog to go along with this video. Um, you can check out my website on caringmindblog.com. Well, what is National Co-Production Week? Basically, it is a week to celebrate and raise awareness of co-production. It is a word or term thrown around quite uh, quite a bit. Uh, everyone likes to say they co-produce or are co-producing, but there are times when it can become a token term. What is co-production? Basically, it's, uh, it can be defined as users of a system joining together to influence the way that services are designed, commissioned and delivered. And I'm talking about the health and social care services and systems. But it can be much more than that, since users should try and get involved with designers of, of these systems and vice versa. In fact, in health and social care and mental health designing and policies, there should be the aim of involving the end user or carer even. So let's make things more easier. Let's look at examples of co-production, or at least the basic examples. Um, this is not an exhaustive list and it can be, well, there can be more added to it. So for instance, let's start with bad terms of co-production. I'll give you at least 10 terms that I can think of. I probably could think of about uh, 30, I suppose. But number one be um, producing health systems without public or service user input. Number two would be not even advertising um, specific workshops, health workshop, commissioning workshops, not advertising the engagements. So basically too few people turn up and perhaps the commissioners will take those people's words as gospel and ending up designing their systems from those workshops. Although it's not as bad as number three, which is not even engaging with the public at all, which is an example, they're not involving the public, the end user, the carer, and just going ahead and designing the systems and then probably coming out saying there wasn't enough time to consult with anyone. Number four is creating stigma with health and social care systems. Now this tends to happen way before co-production. And this tends to keep away the patient or the end user or the, or the carer in wanting to get involved. Hence the term stigma. They feel like, no, basically the end user doesn't want to get involved because they feel they're being pushed away. Number five is um, bullying end users with jargon and expertise. And this is quite common um, if you're unlucky enough to experience this, if you've gone along to a co-production workshop, um, particularly if it's at a very high level and those at that workshop or at that meeting will use specific uh, clinical jargon to make the patient or end user feel left out so they can't contribute and thus you get the fear that it's not worth attending these meetings. And the reason for the, uh, the jargon and being pushed out is that way perhaps commissioners feel that, well, no one wants to co-produce, so we just get along and design our systems without being scrutinized. Number six is feeling co-producing co mistakes are the end user's fault. And, you know, this is quite a difficult one. There will be mistakes in health and social care and policies and things probably won't work out. In fact, I can guarantee quite a few things will not easily work out. But if the health professionals or the commissioners, health commissioners, public bodies, large organisations constantly blame the end user, even though the organisation uh, designed a product, that means they're hiding um, behind the end user and that can't be a good thing um, number seven is top-down engagement and not feeding back again very common um, and a lot of systems out there 
tend to be top down, like we're going from the CEO to the board to senior staff to the staff to the uh, health professionals all the way down to the end user and not giving the end user a chance to influence or get involved right at the top. So let's look at it this way. The, the board cannot see what you call the wood from the trees and they're making decisions that are affecting uh, the community. Number eight is uh, using power to persuade others. Um, again, very common um, and will probably need a huge amount of changes. In fact, it's, it's almost um, in society as, um, as, as it's always been for a very long time. We just put our trust in uh, in power. In fact, I don't know if you've heard of um, Michel Foucault. He uh, he wrote and talked a lot about the uses of power in organisations, in in society, and and how it can um, control others. And I'm afraid uh, this is the situation that can um, attack co-producing results. It's, it's all about power and control in order to keep the, the systems running to serve the few. Uh, using fear to hide systems. Um, not, I don't think it's too common, but it is, it is and has been done. Um, a, a way is, is control. If anyone wants to co-produce, there's a sort of bullying culture to say, you know, you, you know we know better, we've been educated this way. If you try to co-produce with us, there'll be mistakes. There'll be prices to pay. You're not wanted here. Um, there'll be intimidation. And thus, your, av your, your average Joe, your average uh, end user, patient carer, will, will, just not want to, will, will just not want to be bothered. And then lastly, but, but not fully lastly, but this is, I'm keeping this up to number 10 to try and keep the, the video short. You get the wall of silence, where basically these organisations um, should have a, a service user group, but that's not there. You should have a, a family and carers forum, but that's not there. You should have a patient forum, but that's not there. There should be co-producing forums, co-producing networks, but none of them are there. There should be an engagement lead at the NHS Trust or at the CCG um, body, but that's not there. So, and if anyone does ask, the, the, no one seems to answer. And that should raise some sort of suspicions as to why these groups are not there. And this, again, it's, it's something to do with culture. Why are there so many um, senior health professionals not feeding into networks. In fact, we could even go so far as to why they're not um, going out there and creating, along with the patient and the carer, to produce um, networks in these areas. And and to be honest, you know, there's, there's reasons behind it. And I and I let you um, have a think to yourself why these reasons occur. So I've given you. Um, at least 10 examples, I'm sure there's 50 or 100 uh, uh, bad, you know, bad terms for co-production. But let's look at some really good examples of what co-production should be or could be. And there, there are um, a few examples out there, um, but I'll give you 10. Um, one is the most common one, inviting artists to co-produce and not just inviting once, but keep inviting. Um, and using different languages to do so, not as languages as um, speaking Italian or French or anything like that, but trying to keep things as simple, trying to examine um, who the end user is and wanting to hear back from certain systems and saying like, you know, has these systems affected you in a good way? How do they invite the end user? How do they invite the patient? How do they invite the family member to come along and co-produce? Number two is raising awareness of co-production. This shouldn't have to go down to the co-producer. It shouldn't have to go down to the to the unpaid care or to the, the patient who's very unwell to 
keep raising examples. It should really come from those who has the, the resources to do so, to say, look, we are looking to co-produce. We are um, finding new ways of co-production. We support those who want to co-produce, things like that, just raising the awareness. It's not the only way, but it's, it's, it's one of the good ways. Number three is forming and supporting co-production networks. Again, what I mentioned before is if certain um, large health organizations don't seem to have these specific forums, meetings, um, where patient and care are involved, um, something's not right. And it can go even further is, is if someone like an engagement lead should literally go out and see who, you know, what, who are the important organizations out there? How do we set up groups? How do they all network together? Number four is owning up to mistakes. Um, all right, some people think this isn't even co-production, but in, in some forms it, it is. It depends who you're owning up to. Let's say you produced um, a particular policy, it doesn't work. You own up and say, can you co-produce with us? And maybe it still doesn't work, but you want to own up with them. It's not an easy thing to do. We're all human. We all don't want to admit we've done something wrong because there'll be repercussions. But the NHS as a whole needs to be transparent. It bangs on the drum about transparency. And it, and one of the ways it can do that is to own up that it's a, this is a mistake. Number six is being honest through transparency. That's following up through um, owning up to share mistakes. Um, number five, maybe got mixed up in that. I think it's number five, sharing power. Very, very, very important I'll go back to Michelle Foucault again. Um, no one really wants to share power when you've reached the top. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost human nature. Um, however, to guard and battle against that, um, if you share power, just think of how it helps others out there to move things along faster feel like they can trust you, feel like there's no ulterior, some ulterior motive. Um, get the feeling that we're sort of working together. And it's not always health bodies' fault. I've been told that I'm not sharing power and I'm, <laughs> I'm screaming at the top of my lungs to say, look, I'm happy for others to, to co-chair with me to help form the groups because I shouldn't have to want to do it myself. And I think the feeling is that uh, many people tend to not want to do that because they feel there's a fear of things going wrong. And I think really we, we learn from our mistakes or we try and learn. In fact, I know the end user and the care will make more mistakes than perhaps a lot of organizations. But the main thing is learning from that, getting support and not feeling pressured not to make the mistakes because that comes part and parcel with, with co-production. Uh, number seven is rewarding efforts of co-production to the end user. Now, co-production, as I, as I said before, is um, a very loose term. And I feel a lot of co-production is very, very hard to do, especially if you're a patient who is very unwell and you're going out your way to attend these meetings and you're going out the way to say to the policy designers, social care workshops, those organize, organizers, and saying to them, this is how your policies are affecting me. This is how your health systems and health services are affecting me. And if someone's trying so hard uh, without much support and are recognised to try and co-produce it, there should be some sort of reward. I, I don't know what they, you know, these designers, these systems must look to not just award the person, but perhaps the group if need be. Co-production is still, I feel, quite a rare thing. Um, so that's why we even have this National Co-production Week. Number nine is showing education, knowledge and upskilling co-producers. Um, if you look closely at the major um, designers and commissioners out of large and complex organisations through health and social care, We've noticed that it's the ones who've come from perhaps uh, have high expertise in the area have um, come from, um, 
I don't know the word from it. Uh, wealthy backgrounds, that's a different class. Highly educated, highly skilled. Um, and the end users perhaps are those who are unfortunate enough not to share in the expertise. There should be examples um, where there's educating co-producers to perhaps eventually, and I'm not saying this this is always the, the path to um, getting involved, but eventually become those who can also help make decisions and be employed to do so, I suppose. Yes, I'll say it, being employed. Too often we see um, the board being, and I'll, and I'll, I'll say it, white, male, dom dominating um, people. Um, and perhaps the culture again needs to look at, does it truly represent the community or area that they're designing for? Um, in some terms, maybe yes, but mostly no. Um, something's not quite right. Perhaps another video for another day. Another one, lastly, number 10, is keep in contact. Um, very hard to do, especially with the NHS and, and social care system under immense pressure. Um, because basically keeping contact is trying to keep a database of third party charities, uh, those who want to co-produce particular stakeholders um, and end users. And people move on and go about their separate ways and perhaps lose interest. Networks fall apart. I've seen this happen time and time again through my um, maybe 10 years of being involved in the health services and, 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 and social care, I suppose. But anyway, I, I hope you've learned some ideas of what co-production can be. Uh, if you're a patient, service user, or an unpaid care like myself, see what is happening in your area for National Co-Production Week, and good luck in doing so. Co-production, I don't think is easy as people make it out to be. Um, it's still new, new territory as far as I'm concerned. Uh, thank you for watching and don't forget to check out my website and subscribe if you can.